We are here with Ilana Horn, who is a professor of mathematics education at the Peabody College of Education at Vanderbilt University, um, who goes by Lonnie. Lonnie, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Justin, for having me here. Um, we're really excited to talk with you about the work that you've done in mathematics education, in teacher education, and particularly um, how we drive math teaching towards a vision of education that's more equitable, more inclusive, more rewarding to all kids, You know, not just a subset of them. But it might be helpful for our listeners to start a little bit with how did you get into teaching? What was your starting point? What were some of your earliest experiences as a teacher? I got into teaching because I discovered late in life, well, by the time I got to college, I discovered that all those things that I was doing recreationally were actually what mathematicians do. And if you had asked me my freshman year what I thought of math learning, I didn't like it very much. But all the games I was playing, all the puzzles I was solving, all the Escher I was geeking out on, those were all very mathy things. And that was much more like what mathematicians did than the curriculum I studied in school. So I kind of felt like a great injustice had been done. And surely there were other kids out there like me who could find math really cool and engaging and probably did but didn't realize it was math because it wasn't being called that in math class. So I went into teaching math with the hopes of bringing more beautiful, exciting, lovely math to engage more kids in um, the enjoyment of the discipline. And what were, what were some of the sort of early successes or challenges that you had in, in uh, bringing sort of real math into school math? I was very lucky because I deliberately told um, the person who's overseeing our student teaching placements, I said, I know schools are complicated. Can I go in some place where I can try to figure this problem out of getting kids to do cool math? So I worked in two independent schools. One was a hippie school on a farm, which I can tell you about. But the other where I really did my full student teaching was a Quaker school where I was given a lot of latitude to design curriculum. And we somehow convinced um, my cooperating teacher to let me do a unit on infinity with the kids. And um, so I set up the classroom as learning centers. They did a bunch of different explorations on infinity. And the um, they had to do a culminating project. And then we had a debate at the end about whether infinity could fit in your pocket. So it was, I, there's a lot of things I would have changed about it. It was definitely a learning experience. but. Overall, my goal of getting kids to think math was cool and beautiful and worthwhile, it was pretty effective for a lot of kids. And how was that similar or different to the, the hippie school on a farm? <laughs> well, the hippie school on a farm, um, I was more of an assistant teacher. And um, I think the thing that was really important about that was that kids had a lot of autonomy. It was all about, well, there was, there was two emphases. There was community, which um, meant that every Tuesday and Thursday morning, like, all the grades got together and sang songs for half an hour, which was really like a lovely way to start the day. But then the other part of it was that kids had a lot of autonomy in the classroom. So um, there were couches on the periphery of the classroom. And if kids weren't into your lesson, they could go read a book on the couch or go do whatever they felt like. And um, just kind of like get up in the middle of yeah. class. I'm like, that's kind of enough now. Yeah, like I'm done with this. Um, so, I mean, there, there obviously there was a little more complexity to that, but kids really did have the right to opt out of things. And um, so what that taught me was how to read kids for engagement. And, and I had the pressure, the pressure was a lot higher to make your lessons authentically meaningful to kids. You couldn't just sort of like expect them to comply and follow along because you're the teacher and they're the students and that's their job. They had a lot more, um, more degrees of freedom to, to self-regulate in that way. And um, that's, that really influenced me when I was a public school teacher as well. So you, ha so you develop early on these ideas about engagement, about uh, real math and beautiful math versus the thing mm -hmm. that becomes school math. What happens when you bring these ideas as a public school teacher? Um, it didn't, it went well better with the kids than the adults. Let me put it that way. Um, so um, the cl class I was most eager to tackle was geometry because geometry as content has so much beautiful math in it and I was teaching out of a book that was basically um, algebra exercises like masked in geometry um, it was like designed for teachers who thought oh no geometry is the year that kids forget algebra let's make sure to infuse this curriculum so there was no like real sense of Euclidean logic or or how it even developed or what it even means it was just anyway keep doing algebra yeah so but now you're on triangles and so 
I reorganized it to make it much more investigatory, um, to make it more inquiry oriented. And um, I worked really hard to do that. And so the first couple of months, I had a bunch of kids who like came and I hate math, math, blah, blah. And then they were like really active and really engaged. And somewhere around October, November, my department chair came in and said, so what chapter are you on in geometry anyway? I'm like, oh, I'm not on a chapter. And I was so proud of myself. And I showed her the beautiful work the kids had done. I showed them her the posters. I showed her all the cool connections they were making. And she just sort of looked at me and said, <clears throat> If they are not all on chapter five by January, you are going to be harming the children who need to switch classes. And I was devastated because that last thing I wanted to do was harm children. And I had no idea. I was a new teacher. I had no idea how common this was with, when children switched teachers at the semester. But I certainly didn't want to harm anybody. So I kind of wheeled it back a little, dialed it back a little, and um, tried to follow the content sequence of the book, but making it a little more eager. But it was a little artificial because the content sequence of the book really didn't follow the development of Euclidean geometry very well. And I'll never forget, I'm still in touch with this kid, actually, because he was one of my I hate math, I hate math kids who got really engaged. I'll never forget, like, about a week into this, him sitting in the front of my class with his head in his hand like this, and he said, Ms. Horn, you know how you were teaching before? I think I learned better this that way. And it was kind of like, oh, one of the first knives in my gut as a teacher that kind of made me think there's got to be a better way here. Like, we've got structural issues. Because if I, as a first year teacher, am getting kids who walk in the classroom saying they hate math, love math, then we obviously know enough as a field to, to be able to do this, but yet there's these structural institutional pressures that are working against that, and so that kind of became one of the things that pushed me toward wanting to do research. And how do, are there through lines from that work into the kinds of research and work that you're doing with teachers right now? Like how, how do these ideas that you've sort of been stewing on for a lot of years, how are they coming to life for you right now? Well, I think one of the takeaways from even just from that story is that Teachers are in a really complicated position. We as researchers often have the privilege of isolating certain aspects of the classroom, certain factors, certain context, contextual variables, but they have to deal with everything all at once, and they often don't have a lot of say over which conditions they get to have and which conditions they don't get to have. So I approach all of my work with a lot of humility of of that sort of contextual complexity of, of just how hard it is, even if we give them the best curriculum materials, even if we give them the best professional development, of making it a reality in the complicated institutions that schools are, that's just not a trivial thing. I mean, my latest thing that I've been saying is it's actually a complicated act of synthesis. And if you think of like Bloom's taxonomy or pick your favorite whatever, I mean, synthesis is usually the most complicated form of thinking. And we treat it as trivial when we hand teachers tools and say, go do this, go do this in your classroom, because they have to figure out how to make it work with all the other moving parts. And um, with it the particular is, kids they have, yeah, with the particular contacts, exactly. the school day, the bell schedule, exactly. the chairs they have in their room. Exactly. Oh. All those all those very, very real material, cultural, specific things. And so I think that that's really one of the things that's foundational to the work I do. So something in your work that we've been reading and thinking a lot about is this idea of asset framing. And mm -hmm. asset framing is kind of a central piece of what makes effective mathematics education, um, particularly for the kids like the ones you just described mm -hmm. that sort of come in with an I hate math, but like we know for sure they could become an I love math mm -hmm. kind of kid if they're given the right um, context exposure. Could you tell us a little bit about sort of how you define asset framing and how you see it come alive when it does in math classrooms? Right, so I mean obviously the most obvious thing is that asset is the opposite of deficit. And so it's sort of a response to uh, a pretty well-documented phenomenon in literature that um, there are widespread deficit framings of children in schools um, that work against their engagement um, and work against their affinity with school. And so it's, it's partly to define against in contrast to that. But I think that the overall meaning is to really look for kids' strengths. I mean, if you think about how complicated human beings are, nobody's bad at everything, right? And But school only gives kids um, a narrow set of things to show that they're good at. And so 
I think one of the challenges that I pose to teachers is what would it mean for your classroom to look like, what would your classroom need to look like um, in order for all the kids with all their various strengths to have a place at the table, to have something to offer that's meaningful? And what would your curriculum need to look like? What would the interactions need to look like? How would things need to be set up? Um, it's, I think, uh, an attempt to try to be more humanizing, to, to, to really be more welcoming and say that all kids belong here um, and you all have something to offer. And to really take that commitment and, and sort of play it out in, in all aspects of teaching. With your work with teachers as you're either helping to guide them or watching other people helping to guide them towards this more strength-based, asset-based approach, what do you think are some of the most effective starting points? Is it about asking teachers to have conversations about certain topics, to watch certain kinds of teaching, to try certain kinds of practices? Do you have a sense of like, you know, if a, if a math department head came up to you and said, that sounds great, where should I start? What would be some of your first pieces of advice to her? One of the things that I've done that's been pretty effective, and it's not that hard to do, is to ask teachers to take their rosters of the classes that they're currently teaching and see if they can go through and identify a strength for each child. And there's really interesting things that surface um, from that exercise. Um, Sometimes teachers realize things like, there are certain kids in my class that I haven't really talked to enough to be able to answer this question. Um, Sometimes they recognize patterns in, I can say I really recognize these kinds of strengths, but I have a harder time recognizing the strengths of my quiet kids. Or I I get so upset with the kids who act out that I can only see them as the bad kids and I forget to look for what they have to offer. But I mean, it's sort of just a human truism in psychology that like we don't grow where we're not loved, right? And so if you don't have a connection with a child over something that is good about them, something that you like about them, something that you can like celebrate about them, you're not going to help them grow. It's just, that's just true of any kind of human development in any context. So I think that pressing teachers to just look at the kids in front of them right now and to see where their blind spots are because we all have them and then and then being trying to document those blind spots yeah. and try to fill them in yeah you know, and to, exactly and to, to try to think of, well what's my next step like so if i'm the teacher who realizes i really don't know a subset of my kids next week next two weeks like make sure that you have a, a conversation with each of those children you know and no excuses like f- really figure it out talk to their other teachers like this is your job. Like this is what, and, and, and sometimes what teachers say to me is, look, I have 200 kids. And I say, that sounds really, really hard. And that's where I look to the way we organize schools and say, why are we giving teachers 200 kids? That's not reasonable. Not if we really, really are committed to these ideas. And having them know each of them. Yes, yes. When, uh, when, when you see teachers who go on this sort of developmental journey to being, oh, I don't think I'm taking as much of a strengths-based approach as I could to being more successful in adopting asset framing. Like if I walked into a classroom where this was happening really well, like how would a math classroom look different than it would if it wasn't happening? What would be some of the indicators that I could look for that may go, oh, oh, that's the kind of thing that I see now happening in this class um, that I might not have been able to see before? So I think the first thing you see is teachers genuinely connecting with kids, right? Because again, like going back to the thing I said, if I know what's good about you, what there is to celebrate about you, when I say hello to you, I'm probably happier to see you and you feel that just as one person to another. So you see more connection, you see um, less anxiety, more of a sense of belonging, a kind of a pleasant climate. I think that's just the baseline. Um, I think that beyond that though, there are teachers who are able to sort of recognize, um, name, and and describe kids' strengths and sort of have that welcoming, pleasant environment in their classrooms. But the next challenge is really making that meaningful in your instruction. And I think that's a lot, lot harder to do. What, what does that look like in math as compared to English or social studies? Or is it, is it oh, yeah, the same no. or is it really distinctive to no, math? No, I, I think that's a, exactly the right question because I think just like we have to sort of, um, in order, one of the things I didn't say earlier, but one of the things that teachers have to sort of retrain themselves on in thinking about kids from an asset perspective 
is the language of schooling lends itself to putting kids in kind of static categories like here are the honor students here are the kids who are below basic and we offer teachers all these languages all this language that that kind of reinscribes deficit ideas about who kids are so just like they have to retrain themselves to see kids through new eyes they have to retrain themselves to think about math differently because just like i told my own personal story about how all this stuff I was doing that wasn't really showing up in my math classrooms that really was a lot more like what mathematicians do. Like the discipline is so, so rich and this and the school version is kind of anemic. And a lot of where we give kids the opportunity to show their strengths in math is by expanding what we think math is. School math is the part of math that values quick and accurate calculation, right? And the discipline of math values so many other kinds of strengths and aptitudes that aren't typically in the school curriculum. Asking good questions, making really smart connections between ideas, um, developing a, a great representation of an idea, um, being systematic. Um, there, there's, there's things that if you look in the history of mathematics, those are like really, really important ways of being smart. I mean, we, we live in a world where people have supercomputers in their prop pocket. Maybe they're not technically supercomputers. We they have are pretty, supercomputers. Are they? They're pretty super. They're yeah. pretty super. We have powerful computers in our pockets nowadays. So being quick and accurate at calculating, I'm a little perplexed that that is like still the most valued kind of being smart in math, but it is. And all these other things that if you look in the history of mathematics have really moved the field forward, like the major, major developments, um, aren't around being quick and accurate. They're about these other kinds of competencies, yet we don't really give kids those opportunities um, in, in, in most math classes. So the math piece of being asset oriented is making the math in your classroom that you value and that you engage in rich enough that there's a lot of different paths in and there's a lot of different ways to authentically and meaningfully be mathematically smart that matter. Do you have a couple of favorite, um, okay, I've totally bought into this, Lonnie. Um, what's my first step to expand school mm. math? Like what are a couple of these like t high, uh, your rich targets of richness, like yeah. things, that, things that I would read more or explore more? Or, um. I think that the Shell Center has a really great website with a lot of good, rich tasks. And there's some video support that um, shows teachers using the tasks in their classroom. And um, we can link to all that. You can link the, to all of outside. that yep. in your, mm -hmm, on your web, whatever this ends up on. People can get their powerful supercomputers. And yeah, their powerful it. supercomputers and log in. Um, yeah, so there's there's a lot of really good tasks there. Um, Illustrated Math has just developed a whole curriculum that's going to be downloadable for free. Um, there's a lot of really great resources out there. Um, Desmos, uh, the graphing app that's free, um, also has a lot of stuff linked to it, some, some really great activities. So these are all ways that kids can explore mathematical ideas um, in rich and meaningful ways. And um, that, yeah, those are good starting places. Mm -hmm. In your current research, what are some of the puzzles around this that remain most fascinating or perplexing to you? What's, what's the sort of next level of work in your own exploration of these ideas? So I've spent about 20 years looking a lot at people who are either new teachers or new to this kind of instruction. And I was really interested in engaging with teachers who have been really committed for a long period of time. Um, so experienced teachers who've already kind of bought in and um, demonstrated a commitment to what tends to be called ambitious math instruction, like really making sure all kids have access to rich um, math content and so the the project I've been working on we've been working with uh, we have a sample of about 12 experienced math teachers and we've been doing a lot of documentation and feedback on their classroom instruction so their tasks tend to be really good they have great relationships with kids their content knowledge is spectacular they have they have so many things like already in place and so it's been fascinating to see what their next level of learning is and I, if I had to sort of sum up across all 12 teachers I think that um, the thing that they are learning is to listen to kids better um, and that sounds scoldy but I don't mean it to be that way I just mean that 
I think that a lot, it's easy when you're teaching, you're teaching five classes a day, you have this rotating cast of kids coming in and out, you plan your lesson, you wanna execute it, you're trying to keep pace with the curriculum, all the things teachers are contending with, to kind of evaluate the success of a lesson based on sort of the public face of how smoothly it went. Um, and what I see our teachers learning is to listen more carefully as the lesson's going, to hear the kinds of sense that kids are making and the kinds of questions they're asking. They're recognizing more um, the patterns, their own patterns of like circulating around the classroom, their patterns of who they interact with and who they give their, their attention to. And those are things that are really hard to learn in professional development because it's it takes a level of self-awareness that none of us have been endowed with and it and it's like very nuanced and situational sort of exactly. probably hard to describe i mean you're at what part of what you're saying is that actually the the surface features which are easiest to see might not be giving us the best information right. about how we're doing it's really trying to elicit more of the deeper thinking and questioning that kids are doing right well I, i've kind of used, um, if you don't mind me getting a little scholarly here, but Irving Goffman's idea of the front stage and the backstage is mm -hmm. kind of a metaphor. He's, Irving Goffman's a sociologist um, who talked about how there's the front stage of life and there's a backstage and there's also this other thing. But anyway, um, and I think that a lot of teachers sort of operate based on the feedback they're getting on the front stage, yet, especially by adolescents, I work mostly with secondary teachers, um, kids get extremely strategic of how they present to the teachers. One of my favorite videos, and the teacher had a wonderful sense of humor about it, was um, it was like t toward the end of the school year, they're doing a review activity, and um, this one group of kids is very intently talking about the prom and what they're gonna wear and who's going with whom and all this stuff like that when they're supposed to be doing this review activity. As the teacher approaches the group, they switch into math gibberish wait so what's the slope of that line you know they just start saying things that sound <laughs> like math so she keeps on going and as soon as she's out of earshot they go back to prom right so like kids are really really smart and really really strategic with how they manage the teacher's attention both good and bad and so what does it mean to be a teacher in the face of kids who are managing you in that way like how do you get at what's really going on and what they're actually engaging with in your classroom i think that's not a trivial question like i said she had a great sense of humor and laughed really really hard I, well i imagine yeah. most teachers who are listening to this can totally imagine many of their oh. students perform especially i guess secondary teachers i told my uh, students performing similar things yeah i told my high school age daughter about that because i was laughing really hard and she's like oh i do that all the time so yeah apparently it's a thing so if <laughs> you didn't know that now you know um what you know my version of that is I when I was teaching I taught in a class in a relatively early classroom where all kids had laptops mm. um, and so in addition to trying to see some of this I'm like literally trying to see like what's sort of what's going on, on their screen and you start the, the front stage back thing you notice is like when people start switching their tabs uh -huh. real fast when you walk by uh -huh. and those kinds of things yep um, do you have strategies that you that you've seen effective teachers working with or that you've started working with teachers that sort of are like first steps towards getting more into that backstage of kids thinking like what are some what are some ways that 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 teachers can start sort of checking themselves and holding themselves more accountable to okay you know we're at what did it not just go smoothly but am i am i listening enough of the yeah. thinking that i need to understand that that's a great question i think that a lot of times teachers feel like they're only teaching if they're doing something and they're interacting with kids and i think we undervalue sometimes um just sitting back and listening um i told you earlier when we were chatting that um, I have a little bit of an auditory processing problem where I don't filter out background noise. I used to tell my kids, when you're done with a test, just pass notes, because if you start talking, like, I can't, you know. Even if, even if I'm talking, just pass notes with each other, because I can't. Anyway, so I have a little bit of an inability, actually, to, to not listen in on, like, I have that problem still, um, not just in classrooms. Um, and so I think I naturally, because of, the way I'm wired would sort of sometimes huddle down in a corner of my classroom and just close my eyes and listen to what different groups were talking about. I tried to make myself as invisible as a teacher can. It's not easy. Um, I think, though, that 
when kids are really involved in something, they don't necessarily care where the teacher is. So you can kind of like find a little corner and eavesdrop. And I think we need to value eavesdropping a little bit more, um, especially when kids, we've handed off the math to the kids. And we can really hear a lot about group dynamics. We can hear about who's contributing. And there's often lovely surprises in there because a kid who um, doesn't want to participate in whole class discussions at all is really eager to share with their peers even if like if you were just sort of surveying and scanning the classroom their body language may not um, indicate to you that the level of engagement and the the richness of their contribution so and that even part of what i hear you saying to connect a couple of things you said is that when we as teachers change our practice when we change our dynamics it also opens up the opportunity for different kinds of kids to show their strengths like it, like if we change what we're doing it gives other kids a chance to show what they're doing and that might make us more attentive to like oh um when we're not in whole class discussions like this young lady this young man has all kinds of really interesting things to exactly. say i just need to get myself out of the way a little exactly. bit so that person can say those amazing things to their peers and exactly yeah one of the interventions that I um, co-developed when I was at University of Washington um, for pre-service teachers was this thing called a mediated field experience. And um, the way we designed it is we had partner teachers in math classrooms that were working toward this sort of instruction. And um, we, we would start visiting their classrooms in September, like sort of the end of September. So they already had the kids for like a couple weeks. You're they? taking your pre-service teachers from the University of Washington mm-hmm. to a partner high school yes. in the district yes. um, to get to know them. Exactly. So we had these partner teachers. And before we went in, I said, I asked the teachers, can you tell me which kids you're concerned about? And tell me what their challenges are. Like, what are they struggling with? And then I deliberately matched my pre-service teachers with kids who were really different than them. Because I think one of our first go-tos as teachers, when we imagine how a lesson's gonna go and who's gonna like it, is we think of ourselves as students. Um, And I think it's harder to imagine what somebody who's really, really different from us um, is gonna experience in that lesson. So I had one student, for example, who was like super organized, like, man, I would love her to just organize my life because she just had systems for everything. So I sat her next to the kid who always forgot his homework and whose backpack was a total disaster. Like that was her, her student to shadow. I had another student who had never been out of the country, never learned a foreign language. I had him sit next to an immigrant student. And the goal wasn't to have them necessarily support that those kids, but more to be observers of their experiences in the class. And they had some pretty profound ah ahas because I just think it's hard to imagine what it's like to be a student who's so, so different than you, like just fundamentally different than you. And I think part of what teachers need to develop is um, kind of an empathic imagination for not just what they would like. We, We all are inclined to teach the way we prefer to learn. So how do we interrupt that so that we can broaden what we're doing, broaden the activities, and make sure that there really are those footholds um, and um, for other kids, for kids who aren't like us in some important way. Do you have things that you've done with in-service teachers that get at the same idea? Like what, what are some of your favorite yeah, sort of yeah. um, professional learning around empathic imagination? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I've done with in-service teachers a couple of times is, um, Usually, again, around the end end of the first marking period, so like around first quarter, um, to look at, make a list of, I actually didn't make this up. This came from a teacher I used to work with. Um, He was department chair, and he had his um, colleagues make a list of all kids who they were concerned about, like that they might not make a passing grade by the end of the semester, and then write a reason why they think the kid is struggling, and then write what they've done to intervene. So I've done that exercise with teachers and again just like the roster exercise it kind of uncovers like how much are you actually do you actually know about what's going on here. Um, and the other thing one time uh, we took it a step further and we took those lists of kids and we went down to the counseling office and we pulled the cumulative files um, of those children to just sort of see what their academic histories were. Especially um, where there were kids who were really perplexing. So like teachers found things out like, oh, this child just got mainstreamed and recategorized from English language learner where they were in self-contained classrooms that 
had real no real math instruction. So this is not only are they suddenly in an all English classroom, um, but they're woefully underprepared. They're really the not system. well prepared yeah. because they've been doing kind of the same kinds of ratios per percent stuff for the last couple of years. So they'll see things like that. They saw one, I, this one was kind of mind boggling. There was a, a girl who had lost her hearing aid and never had it replaced. Well, I mean, it would be difficult to learn in yeah. auditory classrooms and, and, under and those the teacher and the teacher was like, "Oh my gosh, I have her at the back of the classroom too." Like she had no idea. No one had communicated this information. So part of what this points to again is like, you want to make schools better, like make these kinds of systems stronger, make sure that teachers have these kinds of things communicated to them, because these are things that are above and beyond what teachers typically get in terms of information, but they shouldn't be. We shouldn't have to just like dig and, and do a hunt to find out that a child requires a hearing aid and, and doesn't, doesn't have, have one. one. Yeah. But that's a position a lot of teachers find themselves in. Yeah, that is, but yeah, and that I think is the challenge that we want to pose to our all of our teachers, our most ambitious teachers. That yep, you bo we both all have to work to make these systems stronger. And knowing that like all these systems aren't going to strengthen overnight, we have to think about what we can do individually as a meanwhile to realize that we need to do all we can to get to know our kids as individuals. And mm -hmm. that uh, no, but these concrete strategies about things like how do I write these things down? How do I ask questions? How do I listen? It sounds like um, you know what. what Sort, if, if part of your argument is that our teaching is strengthened with an asset framing that identifies kids' strengths, then there's work to do to find that strengths. And part of that work is like as much as possible thinking about each individual kid, sometimes doing structured activities with our colleagues to mm -hmm. um, try to find and document those strengths and realize where we're falling short or not doing everything we could to find those strengths right. and then putting more time and effort into that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, this has been an enormously enriching conversation, Lonnie. Thanks so much for spending some time with us. Well, thanks for having me. It's been fun. Fun.